Okay, our next presenter is calling in from Korea. Jihoon Suk is a PhD student of Korean modern history at Yonsei University in Seoul, South Korea. His master's thesis from 2015 is also from Yonsei University, the formation and dissemination of Korean traditional music in the 1930s. It was an extensive historical research on the impact of Korean rec record industry in the reshaping and popularizing of what the modern Koreans refer to as, quote, Korean traditional music, end quote, or gugak. Since 2010, he has been working as the senior researcher at the Korean 78 RPM discography project and archive, the largest collection and research initiative of Korean commercial 78 RPM recordings made between 1906 and 1945. He has conducted research for various Korean archives and public institutions, the Korean National Archives, the Independence Museum of Korea, the Korean National Assembly Library, and so on. He is also a co-moderator of the 78 RPM Records and Cylinders fan group, one of the largest groups on Facebook for enthusiasts of vintage sound recordings. Welcome, Ji Hoon. Thank you. No. Thank you, Terry. There was this one fundamental question that I have had as an archivist and a researcher of early Korean sound recordings, how it all began. Since 2011, when I started working as a chief researcher at the Korean 78 RPM discography project in Archive, I have put my best efforts to find the answers for this question. And though there are still holes and gaps that I need to put together, I would like to share what I have found over the course of the past 10 years, finding little bits and clues of hints in three different continents. Our story begins with an American merchant by the name of Everett Fraser a native of Boston who came from a family of merchants importing tea and other goods from the Orient. He founded a big trading company in Yokohama, Japan in the 1860s, and by the end of the next decade, had become the earliest supplier of electric equipment and gadgets in Asia. As the business grew, Fraser had several agents working for him in Japan, China, Hong Kong, Vietnam, and elsewhere in Asia. Beginning in 1884, he also served as a self-appointed Consul General of the Kingdom of Korea in New York. An early investor and frequent business collaborator with Thomas Edison, Fraser was fascinated by Edison's perfected phonograph. And by early 1889, Fraser made arrangements with Edison to have demonstrations of the new phonograph at the consulate and legations of Asian countries located in Washington, D.C., with Walter Miller serving as the demonstrator. On February 7, 1889, Walter Miller stepped into the doors of the Korean legation at 15 Logan Circle, Washington, D.C., and demonstrated the abilities of the phonograph to the Korean ambassadors and his staffs. This was the very first time that a Korean person had actually encountered with the recording technology. Fraser's grand scheme did not end there. About a year later, he made even more ambitious suggestion to Edison, asking him to produce four perfected phonographs to be donated to eminent people in Asia, Li Hong Zhang, Chung Go Fan, who were China's most powerful statesman at the time, Emperor Meiji of Japan, and King Gojong of Korea. Edison wanted to get official endorsements out of these eminent personalities, and Fraser wanted to sell phonographs in Asia in large quantities. The four packages, each containing the phonograph, a year's worth of supply of battery cells, and 24 cylinder blanks, were shipped to Fraser's company in Yokohama by July of that year, and were all delivered and demonstrated for each recipient by the end of August. We don't know whatever became of machines given to the King of Korea or the two Chinese statesmen, but the one that was given to Emperor Meiji of Japan had survived to the present day. Long thought to be lost, it was rediscovered in the collection of the National Science Museum of Japan in 2019. The machine still has the small metal tag which reads, His Majesty the Emperor of Japan with compliments of the inventor Thomas A. Edison. Fraser's scheme failed miserably, however, as the machines were too bulky to set up and extremely delicate to operate. After receiving literally no further orders by any of his customers or agents in Asia, he had given up hopes of selling phonographs in Asia by 1893, but this was not the end of his story as we shall see. 
Now that we now know when Koreans had their first encounter with sound recording technology, we should ask another question. What is the earliest extant sound recording in Korean language? The answer is quite clear and simple. On July 24th, 1896, Alice E. Fletcher, a pioneering anthropologist on Native American culture, whose name might be familiar to some of you as well, recorded three Korean students who were studying at Howard University in Washington, D.C. The resulting six brown wax cylinders containing Korean music and spoken words, now part of the American Folklife Center collection at the Library of Congress, were rediscovered in 1998 by ethnomusicologist Dr. Robert C. Prowine of University of Maryland. Two of the three performers on these cylinders, An Jung-sik and Yi hee Chul, have been identified since its discovery. And here they are, in one of the yearbook photos courtesy of the Howard University. Until very recently, the only available transfers of these cylinders were quite poor-sounding transfers made decades ago. But back in 2019, when I visited LOC's Packard Audiovisual Conservation Center in Culpeper, Virginia for my research, I managed to make arrangements with the staff to make high-quality archival transfers of these cylinders using Nicholas Berg's endpoint cylinder player. And here's a snippet from one of the cylinders containing a short vocal piece known as the Ode to the Moon. For something that was recorded 125 years ago, it sounds quite decent in my opinion. Now, let's talk a little bit more about how the Korean public got familiar with the modern technology of sound recording. By the end of the 1890s, there were many instances where a Korean person could see and hear the wonders of the 19th century Western science. By 1899 or so, one can also find newspaper advertisements put by Korean entrepreneurs about this type of new venture called Yusonggi Choso, or talking machine parlors, in which the owner would charge a patron a small fee for listening a pre-recorded piece of music through ear tubes. Pictured here is a similar type of business as seen in Japan in around 1900. Obviously, when you are aiming a music business to a specific type of patrons, you also want to provide pre-recorded music that reflects the taste of your patrons. And that's exactly what happened. There is an extensive newspaper article on the Korean newspaper called The Independent from April 20th, 1899, in which there is a very detailed description of a makeshift recording session using cylinder phonograph during a banquet held by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Similar newspaper items can be found in Korean newspapers throughout the first half of the 1900s, although, unfortunately, there are no surviving examples of these early Korean-made cylinders from this era. Until about 1903-04, most talking machines imported by Koreans were cylinder phonographs, with the vast majority of them being Columbia and Pathé machines. Pictured on the bottom here is a 1901 Korean advertisement for a Columbia Type AB graphophone with a caption that reads, A machine that talks. But by 1903-1904, these gramophones began to show up on Korean shores. Now, this was around the time that major record companies in the West began this massive business venture known as the Recording Expedition in Asia. It all started with the legendary recording engineer Fred Geisberg of the Gramophone and Typewriter Company, beginning in September 1902. Over the course of about a year, he visited India, China, Japan, Thailand, and many other countries in Asia, making roughly 1,700 sides of Asian music and spoken words, spanning 16 different languages. Though Geisberg had absolutely no knowledge of Asian music of any kind, he had received a tremendous amount of help from the intermediaries, mostly expat businessmen in Asian countries who were familiar with the local culture and customs and, of course, musical taste. Right after the gramophone company announced their release of Asian discs, Columbia quickly followed suit. Columbia's president, Edward Easton, struck a deal with a Japanese businessman named Ezawa Kingoro, the head of the Tokyo-based Tenshodo Trade Company, in November 1903. Columbia quickly dispatched a recording engineer, whose identity remains unknown, to Japan to cut more than 700 sides of Japanese music in Tokyo and Kyoto in 1903 or 1904. Another bit of eye candy here, but this one is not necessarily politically correct. This is one of the photos Fred Geisberg took during his time in India in 1902. 
All recording expeditions of the era had a bit of an undertone of imperialism, colonialism, and a bit of racism, a subject too heavy to unpack during this presentation. But it is quite ironic that some of these recordings made by these Western concerns are now considered to be precious cultural artifacts, a missing link to the lost past for many, many Asian and other non-Western countries. Anyway, going back to the history of recording expeditions in Asia, to prevent unwanted competition between them after Columbia entered the Asian market, the Gramophone Company and Victor formally signed an agreement to divide the Asian market between them on August 3rd, 1904. In this initial negotiation, Victor would have sales rights for China, Indochina, and the Philippines, whereas GNT would have India and Japan. However, Victor had second thought about this after the outbreak of the Russo-Japanese War in 1904. The war was practically the deciding battle on which country would take Korea as their territory, and the Japanese, which was the winning side of this war, was having an economic boom. The exports to Japan were skyrocketing for all American manufacturers, and Victor was no exception. Because of this, Victor decided to bring the gramophone company to the negotiating table again in late 1905. This second negotiation resulted in another official agreement on June 25, 1907, which gave Japan, Korea, eastern coastline of China, and Russian Far East as Victor's territory, while GNT secured their sales rights on the everywhere else. This beautiful and unequivocal agreement, as Elder Johnson had put it, lasted all the way up to 1956, virtually unchanged for almost 50 years. Another bit of eye candy, a gramophone and typewriter advertisement from February 1904 after the outbreak of the Russo-Japanese War. As you can see, they only cared about selling records in the midst of global conflict. Now that uh, we have learned all about all these corporate history of Asian talking machine market, let us go back to what these companies were doing to produce offerings for their Korean customers. In 1904, Columbia sent two recording engineers, Charles Carson and Harry Marker, to the Orient, and over the course of the next four years or so, they began to make recordings of Chinese and Japanese music in various locations. During their marathon session in Osaka, where they have set up on a makeshift studio in a warehouse of a candy store, as you can see on the left, two Korean singers, Han Yuno and Choi Hong Mei, cut 30 sides of the Korean music, making their recordings the very first commercial recordings of Korean music ever produced. So this was recorded in February 1906, but by the time these records were put on sale in January of next year, 1907, Columbia had severe ties with Tenshodo and had new arrangements with a company called Sankodo, which later became the Nipponopon Company in 1909. Out of these 30 sides issued in January 1907, only 10 sides have been discovered so far. These are all of them, all existing in single copies. Eight of them were discovered in a warehouse in a farm in, in 1989. The other two came out on eBay in 2007 and 2016, respectively. Here's a closer look on one of the records. The trademark there is for the San Kodo Company, which literally translates as the Three Light Company. The Three Lights are the sun, the moon, and the pole star, hence the name and the logo. Though all of the extant Columbia sides are nearly mint in their physical condition. All of them suffer from excessive noise and no volume, a typical sonic problem that can be found in virtually every Asian and non-Asian Columbias of the era. In the meantime, the gramophone company and Victor was also trying to initiate a second recording expedition to the Far East. The gramophone company chose William Conrad Geisberg, the younger brother of Fred, for the job, dispatching him to India in May 1906. By the time that Will Geisberg came to Japan in November 1906, the gramophone company apparently had accepted the offer from Victor to exchange the Asian market territories. It also seems that Victor considered Korea as a part of the Japanese market by this point. Korea has lost much of its sovereignty to Japan, 
especially after the signing of the so-called Ulsa Treaty in November 1905, of which the diplomatic right of the Korean government was forcibly given to the Japanese government. Anyway, after finishing his work in Japan, Will Geisberg came to Seoul, Korea in late November of that year. He had found his help from Homer B. Halbert, an American missionary, businessman, and diplomat who had been living in Korea since 1886. Herbert acted as a talent scout for this recording session, even receiving a Storo violin from Geisberg for his efforts. Apparently, it became quite obvious that the records were to be issued by Victor at this point, as Herbert indicates that Geisberg introduced himself as a representative of Victor. Herbert originally wanted to set up a store of his own to sell Victor products, but by January 1907, he was entangled in the international diplomatic turmoil which made him leave Korea for good by April of that year. Therefore, all Victor products sold in Korea after 1907 were dealt by a company called Sale and Fraser Trade Company of Yokohama. And this is when our old friend Everett Fraser comes back to us. After his failed attempt to sell Edison's phonograph back in the early 1890s, his son, Everett Jr., had become the Asian sales representative of all Victor products in Japan and China in 1906. In fact, the Sale and Fraser Trade Company was the biggest shareholder of the Victor Talking Machine Company of Japan, JVC, when it was launched in 1927. During his stay in Seoul, Will Geisberg made a total of 101 sides, 36 7-inch sides, and 65 10-inch sides, making his final recording on December 3, 1906, according to documentations provided to me by the late Alan Kelly just before his passing in 2015. These masters, along with about 500 sides of Japanese records that Geisberg cut up a month earlier, were shipped directly to Camden, New Jersey, where they were processed. The original ledgers for these sides had survived in the Sony Music Archive in New York, and with the help of Dr. John Bolig, another ARSC member, I managed to find them, as you can see here on the left. Interestingly, the ledger indicates that five sides out of these 101 Korean sides were either damaged or broken during transit, making the actual number of issued sides to be 96. So out of these 96 sides, we now have a total of 27 sides known to have survived. 16 out of these 27 sides were actually discovered by myself between 2014 and 2020 the bulk of which was found in the collection of the New York Public Library, thanks to the help from Daniel Cordobez at NYPL. The 1906 Korean Victor recordings are historically and culturally significant in many ways. They were the very first commercial sound recordings ever recorded in Korea. They feature over 50 different individual musicians and over 10 different regions represented. Because of this, these recordings provide a unique and fascinating glimpse into the musical environment and taste of the pre-modern Korea, a lot of which have been completely lost to history. Because of this, the discovered recordings served as basis for musical reconstructions for musicologists, ethnomusicologists, and the performers of gugak. Gugak is the umbrella term for traditional Korean music. Now, finally, here are some samples of these discs. The first one is Yoksa Taryong, the laborer's song, which was very popular in the late 19th century. This is, incidentally, the only 7-inch disc discovered so far. Notice the gramophone matrix number 3208D on the bottom. Next is Yukakko-san, which is a festivity music performed in state banquets. This is the only extant recording with two label variations. One is this no nipper label used for Chinese and Korean victors in 1906 and 1908. And the other is the conventional victor label of the era.
The third one here is my personal favorite, two court jesters, eunuchs no less, imitating a fierce dogfight. This one apparently sold quite well, as there are three copies of this record that has surfaced so far. <laughs> And finally, Huangshi de Chita, the Royal Procession March. Not only this is the only documentation of the Royal Procession music in existence, it was also the subject of an extensive musical reconstruction concert by the National Gugak Center, the state-sponsored Academy of Korean Traditional Music, in 2016. I was a special guest of honor for this particular concert, which was one of the best moments in my life. This is all for now. Thank you for following my journey of research, and I will be happy to answer any of the questions you have about my findings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jihoon. That was fa fantastic. It sounds like you have single-handedly taken this subject and brought it out to the world, and that's very, very impressive. Very impressive. Thank you. We do, ha we do have a couple of questions. Uh, you did you did mention that Geisberg traveled to Japan and Korea and William Madison wants to know if Geisberg's travels also took him to China. I mean, his uh, like his older brother, Fred, in 1903, did go to um, go to China. I mean, he was primarily uh, recording in uh, Shanghai and Hong Kong, as I believe. And but I think in 1906, Will did not actually go to China at this time. So um, yeah, I think that answers the question here. Yeah. Okay, um, and Gary Atkinson asks, and he has a comment also, let me ask the question first. He says, is there a discography for these recordings and for the period discussed? But he follows that up with, he says, I have a small but potent collection of world music 78s. This kind of recordings never fail to blow me away. Not sure about the dog barking recording, which I was gonna ask you about too. <laughs> Though, oddly enough, I have heard similar recordings from elsewhere in the world, including the USA. So his question again was, is there a discography? So I'm um, in terms of the actual 1906 recordings, the Columbia, the Columbia's and the Victor's, I'm actually working on um, compiling up a like a complete discography as as best like as best as I can, which is a little bit challenging because um, there is a gap in the information that I have. So I have the complete listing of the, the 1906 Columbia's, but uh, in terms of uh, as far the victors are concerned, um, I only have the 10 inch, like complete list of the 10 inch size, but I can't find the seven inch uh, catalog as, as yet. Uh, there's one person, there's one private collector in Korea who actually has 
boast the ten, seven inch and 10 inch um, catalog in his hands, but he is very reluctant so far um, to share his what he has. So I have no, no access to it. But um, at, the, at, the same, at the same time, I do have a um, complete listing of the 10, um, like 10 inch sides. And of course it matches up perfectly what, uh, of what we have in, in the original ledgers at, at Sony Music Archive in New York. So um, yeah, then, and besides that, I, we actually at the Korean um, 78 RPM discography project actually created this whole website, a database actually. Um, in fact, I'm not sure if I can show this to you right now, but um, this is the website. So uh, unfortunately, everything is in Korean. We are still working on uh, making an English version of it. But basically what it is, is that uh, we have all the scans. And if you click on the individual titles, we have all these um, titles and the, uh, the matrix numbers and everything, the sound clips and all the, um, all this, all the like um, advertisement and catalog information that we actually found so far. So um, we have about um, between 1906 to about 1945, we have about 12, um, 12,000 signs ever issued in Korea. And we basically had have almost all of it. So yeah, so um, basically <laughs> um, that. Um, Anyway, I don't know how you sleep. <laughs> you seem like very busy. Well, but... sleeping only like four hours a day actually kind of helps. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, so, so um, yeah. <laughs> There's another question from an anonymous user. The question is such an interesting presentation. What was your research process like? Well, I mean, so I'm, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm actually uh, trained as a historian. So a lot of um, my um, research is I and goes, I mean, like, it's mostly about the documents and, you know, primary sources and, you know, just um, trying to like, just trying to dig into the spot there, like where it is most likely to, uh, to find something that I like, that I have, that I can like actually use to for my own research. And uh, it's just like trial and error. And it's just, <laughs> sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes, and, but I got very lucky. And I specifically mentioned several of these, uh, several of um, member, uh, members of the ARSC on this presentation, as you probably heard, um, like those people were very, uh, instrumental in in terms of this particular research that I was uh, that I was that I have been doing for the last 10 years and yeah and um, yeah I'm extremely uh, grateful for that great uh, there's one comment and then one last question the comment mm -hmm. is from Alyssa Winzinski I apologize she said uh, great job Jihoon loved hearing the recordings it was really cool that you could pinpoint the first time a Korean person experienced recorded sound technology so yeah. fabulous Mm -hmm. And then Meve, I apologize if I pronounced that incorrectly, Meve Sheehan asked, is there graphic art associated with these recordings, catalogs, or posters? Um, I did show several of these things. Um, like, I mean, I didn't have much time to include all of it, but again, um, I think I showed two uh, contemporary images. One was the first, very first image that I used at the title page, which is this Korean man listening to a Victor phonograph. And like, I find, I always find that particular photograph to be very cute. Um, it's it's one of the advertisement messages uh, like uh, photographs that they use in the uh, early 1900s. And the last photo that I use on the uh, at the very end of our pre my presentation was also contemporary. And there are a few other, um, um, you know, illustrations and, you know, artwork that depicts um, Victor or Columbia uh, machines. But anyway, I like in, in Korean context, that is. But um, yeah. And once, of course, if you go into the like 1920s and 30s, when uh, Korean, when the Korean record market was in full but uh, full boom, um, you know, you have tons and tons of like um, imageries and, you know, like artwork. So, um, but anyway, yeah, that's slightly out of this scope for this presenta presentation anyway. So um, yeah. just one last quick question. Can you just briefly tell us the dog fight recording? What, what is, all, <laughs> what's that all about? So uh, it's, as I said, it's very interesting. And the label uh, says that the performers were two eunuchs, like uh, castrated men, uh, were, uh, working as a court jester in the Korean royal court. And um, yeah, it's just, it basically says what it is, um, dogfight. And of course, uh, dogfight was a very popular form of entertainment, uh, especially uh, because with 
you know, it was a, also a very popular form of um, how to put this baiting and, you know, like gambling. So, um, yeah. And yeah, of course, there were some other um, recordings, like similar recordings like that. And, you know, found in American catalogs. I think I, there's a Columbia, at least I think I, I saw one, a Columbia recording of seen at a dog fight or something like that uh in american um columbia catalog but you know so i guess the whole beauty like the whole gist of it is that uh, the um you know like it reproduces the sound rather well i mean the whole like human like human imitating dog fight you know it's you know it's a novelty so um it, yeah i guess yes. that's the reason that's the reason why i did it did that so. <laughs> that was really great well thank you so much to now get some sleep, okay? <laughs> uh, well, I'll be around. I'll be actually around in the lounge for those who are okay. who might be interested. So anyway, so yeah. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.